Hello, my dear. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. Today is a very important lecture, which is breast cancer. We know that breast cancer constitutes a large problem all over the world. Okay? So, what we are going to discuss today, the definition of breast cancer and its epidemiology, risk factors, pathology, pathophysiology, clinical picture, screening methods, diagnosis, and treatment. Okay, let us start with the definition. Breast cancer is a malignancy arises in epithelium of the ducts, most commonly because it constitutes 85%. So, epithelium of the ducts is the origin of breast cancer in 85%, or lobules in 15% in the glandular tissue of the breast. As you see in this picture, this is the glandular tissue of the breast in between the resistrum. The glandular tissue of the breast is consists of lobule and the ducts. These are the duct, and this is the lobule. Okay, duct is affected by 85% and the lobule is affected by 15%. So, this is as regard breast cancer. But also malignancy can arise from stroma of the tissue of the breast. But it is less common than the epithelium of the duct and the epithelium of lobules. Okay, okay. So, breast cancer evolves silently and the most disease is discovered on routine screening that's why screening program for breast cancer is very important okay what about epidemiology epidemiology is very important because you know how big is the problem how big is the health problem okay so breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in women in the United States okay and also you can consider it the second leading cause of death in the United States okay in women by WHO statistics in 2020 there were 2.3 million women diagnosed with breast cancer and 685,000 deaths globally, okay? So just in 2020. At, at the end of 2020, there were 7.8 million women alive who are diagnosed with breast cancer in the past five years. So this make breast cancer is the most prevalent cancer okay so also you should know that invasive breast cancer affect one in eight women during their lifetime by the time they reach the age of 90 okay of course if the the we are talking about the duration of age to 80 or 70 the percentage will be less because one in eight constitutes 12.4 percent and this is a high instance okay so one in eight women in her lifetime suspected that it, uh, she reached the age of 90 okay okay so this is a very big health problem what about the risk factor we have many risk factors age is one of the strongest risk factor because with increasing the age the risk increase family history breast cancer gene mutation brca1 and brca2 personal history lifestyle factor gynecologic history exogenous hormone use breast changes lobular carcinoma in situ, radiation therapy, and diet. We will explain each one separately, okay? Let us go with the first, the age. As I said, the strongest risk factor for breast cancer is age, okay? So, the incidence of breast cancer continue to increase with the advancing age of women. 
What is the median age at diagnosis? It is 60 years, okay? What about family history? Okay, so family history is very important in breast cancer. What about first degree relative, like mother, sister, daughter? If they are positive for breast cancer, the risk is increased, okay? Okay, what about distant relative? Slight risk increase, okay? But the risk is increased considerably if first degree relative like mother sister or daughter diagnosed with breast cancer before okay so double or triple the risk of developing cancer in a woman okay when two or more first degree relatives have breast cancer risk may be five to six times higher What about cancer gene mutation, breast cancer gene mutation, PRCA1, PRCA2? About 5 to 10% of women with breast cancer carry a mutation in one of the two known breast cancer genes. The risk of developing breast cancer by age 80 is about 72% with BRCA1 mutation and 69% with BRCA2 mutation. So the risk is more with BRCA1 than BRCA2, but both of them carry high risk. So women with high risk for breast cancer should be screened for gene mutation, BRCA1 and BRCA2. Okay. Also, women with BRCA1 mutation also have an approximate 44% lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer. Risk among women with BRCA2 mutation is about 17%. So there is also risk of ovarian cancer. BRCA1 gene mutation reach 44% and BRCA2 gene mutation 17%. What about personal history? Is it affecting the woman? Is that a risk factor for breast cancer? Okay. Having had in situ or invasive breast cancer increases risk. Risk of developing cancer in the contralateral breast after mastectomy is about 0.5 to 1% per year of follow-up. Okay. So suppose a lady have previous breast cancer in one side. Okay. And she did mastectomy and received the, the all treatment. What is the risk of the other contralateral breast? The risk reach up to 1% per year of follow-up. So it is important. Also, if she has had before carcinoma in situ in the duct or lobule, it is also elevating the risk of occurrence of invasive breast cancer. What about lifestyle factors? Okay, women who smoke or drink alcohol may contribute, may be at risk of breast cancer. So, at increased risk of breast cancer. Women are counseled to stop smoking and to reduce alcohol consumption. Okay, this is as regards lifestyle factors. What about gynecologic history? The early menarche, late menopause, or late first pregnancy increases risk. Also, you should know that women who have a first pregnancy after age 30 are at higher risk than those who are in a leprous. Okay? What about exogenous hormone use as a risk factor? Very important, really. In premenopause age, exogenous hormone could be what? Could be oral pills, combined oral pills, or injection contraception, hormonal contraception. Okay? So both estrogen and progesterone in premenopause given in, in the form of oral pills or hormonal injection contraception elevate the risk of breast cancer if it's taken for long duration, okay? But in postmenopausal age, what is the exogenous hormone? Maybe hormone replacement therapy given to the woman to treat the menopausal symptom. So, hormone replacement therapy 
estrogen and progesterone in postmenopausal lady and contraception hormonal contraception in premenopause so this is the two category of patient premenopause and the postmenopause okay what about prostate changes as a risk factor history of a lesion that required the biopsy before increase the risk okay benign lesion associated with slight increased risk of developing invasive breast cancer include what moderate or florid hyperplasia hyperplasia in breast may be mild may be moderate or florid florid is the severest form of hyperplasia okay but it is not dangerous like the atypical endometrial hyperplasia because if hyperplasia associated with a tibia, this is precancerous, okay? So, benign lesion like moderate or florid hyperplasia without a tibia or fibro, complex fibroadenoma or sclerosing adenosis or babyloma slightly elevate the risk of breast cancer, okay? So, what about the risk if the woman have lobular hyperplasia or ductal hyperplasia with a tibia a typical one a typical hyperplasia risk is about four to five times higher than average in patient with a typical ductal or lobular hyperplasia okay what about depressed density seen sometimes during mammography it was found that this breast density which is increased is associated with 1.2 to 2.1 fold increased risk of breast cancer so when you notice increase the breast breast density please do follow up okay also risk factors as lobular carcinoma in situ okay Lobular carcinoma in situ increase the risk of developing invasive carcinoma in either breast by about 7 to 12 times. Invasive carcinoma develops in about 1 to 2 per percent of patients with lobular, lobular carcinoma in situ annually. Okay. What about radiation therapy? Is it a risk factor? Exposure to radiation therapy before age 30 increased risk. Yes. Mantle field radiation therapy but for Hodgkin lymphoma, for example. About quadruplet. Quadruplet risk of breast cancer over the next 20 to 30 years. So, receiving radiotherapy before age of 30 for any reason like Hodgkin lymphoma management for example, increased risk of breast cancer over the next 20 to 30 years. What about diet as a risk factor? Diet may contribute to development or growth of breast cancer, but conclusive evidence about the effect of particular diet like high fat is lacking. Okay? So, we cannot swear that fatty diet increase the risk of breast cancer but maybe has a risk so, some risk obese postmenopausal women are at increased risk but there is no evidence that dietary modification reduces risk let us go to the pathology most breast cancers are epithelial tumors that develop from cells lining duct or lobule as we mentioned before okay <coughs> Less common are non epithelial cancer. What is the non epithelial cancer? Non epithelial cancer like angiosarcoma, primary stromal sarcoma, phyllodes tumor coming from what? From where? What is the site? From the breast stroma. Okay? So, this is rare types, but the commonest is the epithelial tumor. Epithelial tumor is coming from where? From duct more commonly and from lobules, okay? So, that is the commonest, of course. 
So cancer is divided into carcinoma in situ and invasive cancer. Carcinoma in situ and invasive cancer. Carcinoma in situ, there is no invasion to stroma. There is proliferation of cancer cell within ducts or lobules and without invasion of stromal tissue. And you have two types, either ductal carcinoma in situ or lobular carcinoma in situ. Ductal carcinoma in situ constitute 85% of carcinoma in situ. Okay? Detected only by mammography and it may involve a small or wide area of the breast if wide area is involved with microscopic invasive foci may develop over time. It's dangerous. Okay. What about lobular carcinoma in situ? It's often multifocal and bilateral. We have two types of lobular carcinoma in situ, either the classic one or pediomorphic one. What is the difference? The classic one is not malignant, but increased risk of developing invasive carcinoma in either breast. And this non palpable lesion is usually detected via biopsy. It is rarely visualized with mammography. This is a classic lobular carcinoma in situ. But what about biliomorphic lobular carcinoma in situ? It behaves more like ductal carcinoma in situ. It should be excised to negative margin. So it's dangerous one, the biliomorphic one. What about the pathology of invasive carcinoma? It is primarily, and the commonest is the adenocarcinoma, 80% infiltrating ductal type. Most of the remaining cases are infiltrating globular. We said before, ductal type is the commonest, 85% and 15 for the globular, okay? So adenocarcinoma is the commonest pathology. Rare types include medullary, mucinous, metaplastic, and the tubular carcinoma. Mucinous carcinoma usually develop in older women and show slow growing, okay? Most of these rare types of breast cancer have much better prognosis than women with other types of invasive breast cancer. However, metaplastic one is dangerous and has the worst prognosis. Metaplastic one, okay? Also, you should know in the pathology of breast cancer, special types like inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer, what is the story of this? Is a fast growing, particularly aggressive cancer and often fatal one, okay? Cancer cells block the lymphatic vessels in the breast skin. So, breast appear inflamed and the skin appears thickened, resembling the cover of an orange, the orange peel. So we call it bidorange appearance. Okay, so cancer cell block the lymphatics, so the skin becomes thickened, dimpled, resembling orange peel. So bidorange appearance. Okay, usually inflammatory breast cancer spread to the lymph nodes in the arm bed in the axillary area okay the lymph nodes feel like hard lumps however often no mass is felt in the breast itself because this cancer is dispersed throughout the breast so don't be surprised if you found the no mass a while there is this aggressive inflammatory breast cancer why because dispersed through the breast but you will notice pathologic large lymph nodes, okay? And the characteristic bit orange appearance and the second skin. Another special pathology in breast cancer is the Paget's disease of the nipple. Okay, Paget's disease of the nipple is different than Paget's disease related to metabolic bone disease, okay? So, please differentiate both, okay? 
This is a form of ductal carcinoma in situ that extend into the skin over the nipple and the areola, manifesting with a skin lesion, eczematous or psoriform lesion. The skin is scaly, inflamed. Okay, erythematous. Characteristic malignant cells called budget cells are present in the epidermis. So let us go to the pathophysiology of breast cancer. Breast cancer invade locally the surrounding, either to the pectoralis major muscle, to the chest wall, ribs, or superficial to the skin, then spread through the regional lymph nodes, bloodstream, or both. So metastatic breast cancer can affect different organs in the body, maybe lungs, liver, bone, brain, and the skin. Most skin metastases near the site of breast surgery. Okay? So some breast cancer may recur sooner than others. Why? Because there is difference between the types of breast cancer. Is it carrying hormone markers or not, for example? So, for example, metastatic breast cancer may occur within three years in patients who are negative for tumor markers or occur more than 10 years after initial diagnosis and treatment in patients who have an estrogen receptor positive marker. So the possibility of recurrence is less if this hormone marker was positive, while if it is negative, the possibility of recurrence may happen within three years. If the positive marker of estrogen and the progesterone present, the possibility of recurrence is more than 10 years. So there is difference, okay? What about hormone receptors, estrogen and the progesterone receptor? Those nuclear hormone receptors promote DNA replication and the cell division when the appropriate hormone binds to them. So, what about postmenopausal patients? About two thirds of postmenopausal patients with cancer have an estrogen receptor positive tumor. Okay, incidence of estrogen receptor positive tumor is lower among premenopausal patients. So, it is common or more in postmenopausal. About two thirds of postmenopausal patients estrogen receptor positive tumor. Okay, but the incidence is lower in premenopausal patients. What else as regards to hormone receptor? There is an important, another one, human epidermal gross factor receptor 2, abbreviation HER2. Okay? Its presence correlates with poorer prognosis at any given stage of cancer. HER2 receptors are overexpressed in about 20% of patients with breast cancer. Okay, so it carry poorer prognosis and you should know about it. What about breast cancer genes? As I mentioned before, BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutation increase the risk of developing breast cancer to up to 70%. Prophylactic bilateral mastectomy reduce the risk of breast cancer by 90%. Other genetic mutations that increase the risk of developing breast cancer include mutation in CHEK2 or BLB2 or ATM or other genetic mutations. So those gene mutations are usually included in the panel genetic testing. What about the clinical picture in breast cancer? Okay. The patient may discover the mass by herself, then ask for medical advice, then confirm it by physical examination, or may be detected during the screening program for breast car carcinoma. Okay, so maybe a complaint from the patient that she she felt an abnormal mass in her breast and 
she asked me medical advice then the doctor examined the, the breast and found the mass then he did an ultrasound then he did a biopsy and so on so on so on. okay so the patient presented with a mass what else sometimes the patient also present with enlargement of the breast or nondescript sickening of the breast or breast pain however breast pain never to come alone so if the patient complain of breast pain alone it is not maybe it's something non significant okay okay so breast pain may be present but is almost never the sole presenting symptom of breast cancer okay what else the patient may present with skin changes of, with sometimes of breast cancer as i mentioned before the inflammatory breast cancer the budget's disease of the navel in the budget's disease of the navel skin changes include erythema crusting scaling and discharge but the problem is these changes usually appear so benign so that the patient ignores them and this is a problem the patient may ignore these signs because she feels that something like related to inflammation will resolve spontaneously or with using some cream medication and so on and this problem will cause because there is delay in diagnosis for a year or more and you should know that about 50 percent of patients with budgets disease of the navel have a valuable mass at presentation because of this delay okay what else skinny changes the patient may present with inflammatory breast cancer as i mentioned before manifest as erythema enlargement of the breast with orange appearance okay seeking seeking breast skin is dumpling like orange peel that's why we call it bit orange appearance also nipple discharge is common or the patient sometimes coming late with symptoms and signs of metastasis so breast cancer present with symptoms and signs of metastatic disease like what like pathologic fracture jaundice abdominal pain dyspnea neurological manifestation there is also brain metastasis what about physical examination a common finding during physical examination is asymmetry or a dominant mass okay a slightly firmer sickening in one breast but not the other may be a sign of cancer so take care about this just a slightly firmer sickening in one breast may be a sign of cancer diffuse fibrotic changes in quadrant of breast usually the upper outer quadrant are more characteristic of benign disorder so don't afraid from this because maybe fibroadenosis so fibrotic changes especially in in quadrant of breast and usually the upper outer quadrant are more characteristic of benign disorder so we should differentiate okay more advanced breast cancer are characterized by one or more of the following on physical examination fixation of the mass to the chest wall or overlying the skin because infiltrating chest wall or the skin above so it is becomes fixed the tumor is fixed satellite nodules or ulcer in the skin matted or fixed axillary lymph nodes suggested tumor spread as does supraclavicular or infraclavicular lymphadenopathy of course we should see the patient before all these advanced signs okay but we are saying if the patient neglecting her symptoms and signs and didn't go to the screening program for breast cancer she may came in late stage 
with these sides fixed mass to the scan or chest wall or skin nodules or ulcer or matted or fixed axillary lymph nodes so what is the differential diagnosis the differential diagnosis include breast abscess fat necrosis fibroadenoma so what about screening for breast cancer is women should be screened yes yes but the professional societies differ only on the recommended age at which to start screening and the precise frequency of screen okay so the difference between professional society in what in when to start the screening and the frequency of screening at which age we should start and how every year do screening this is the frequency of screening or every two years some believe one year is, is better some believe two every two years is quite enough and so on as regard the age maybe the age of 40 45 or 50 the starting point so this is the difference between the professional society in this area but all of them have the same decision that women should be screened okay but what is the screening modality you know mammography is, is the most important one and the mammography may be 2d or 3d which is very important one okay also there is clinical breast examination by healthcare practitioner also there is magnetic resonance imaging for high risk patient okay screening using mammography well, let us start with the mammography it was considered the gold standard and so on and we have 2d and the 3d one okay screening mammography guidelines for women with average risk of breast cancer vary but generally screening start at the age of 40 or 45 or 50 and the screening is repeated every year or two until age 75 or life expectancy is less than 10 years and this picture show you how the mammography is done the breast between the two blades here and the ludus x-ray coming can be to view either oblique view or craniocaudal view as in this picture you can see this is on the left side the craniocaudal view and on the right side here is the mediolateral oblique view okay and in this picture you can see micro calcification here and here the ducts okay so mammography there is low dose x-ray of post breast And we have two views, as I mentioned, craniocaudal or mediolateral oblique. And you should know that mammography is more accurate in women over 50. Why? Because with aging, fibroglandular tissue in the breast tend to be replaced with fatty tissue. So decrease fibroglandular or replacement of fibroglandular tissue with fatty tissue can be more easily distinguished from abnormal tissue because fatty tissue can be easily distinguished from abnormal tissue so mammogram is more accurate in a woman above age of 50 why because there is a replacement of some of fibroglandular tissue with fatty tissue and this fatty tissue can be distinguished from the abnormal tissue okay
Okay, mammography is less sensitive in women with dense breast tissue and some states mandate informing patient that they have dense breast tissue when it is detected by screening mammography. So this is a problem with mammography. The women who have dense breast tissue can be evaluated better with MRR, okay? Also ultrasound can give me benefit, okay? So the problem in the mammography is women with breast dense, breast tissue, okay? So women with dense breast tissue may require additional imaging tests like two senses, and this is called three-dimensional mammography. This is the more advanced type of mammography, okay? Or MRI, as I said before, MRI may be the solution of dense breast tissue, okay? So 2D mammography has a problem with this type of the breast tissue, dense breast tissue. Okay, what about breast tumor synthesis or what's called three-dimensional mammography? Breast tumor synthesis done with digital mammography increases the rate of cancer detection slightly and it decreases the rate of recall imaging. This test is helpful for women with dense breast tissue However, the test exposes women to almost twice as much radiation as traditional mammography. And this is a disadvantage of breast tumor cells. The woman is exposed to twice radiation than traditional mammography. And in this picture, you can notice the difference between 2D and 3D mammography. On the right side, this is a 2D. You can see the ducts here, and you can see it more definitely with 3D mammography, with three-dimensional dimension, dimensional mammography, or what is called the breast tumor synthesis, digital mammography. Okay, let us go to the next point in screening, which is breast examination. Clinical breast examination is usually part of routine annual care for women above 40. In the United States, clinical breast examination augments rather than replace screening mammography. So the American Cancer Society recommend against screening with clinical breast examination. Also American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists recommends counseling patient about its diagnostic limitation. However, in some countries Mammography is considered very expensive. Okay, so, so what? What they are going to do? They can't tolerate mammography because of the cost. So, clinical breast examination is the sole screening method. And you should respect this. What about breast examination? Self-examination. The patient do it by herself alone as a screening method has not shown a benefit and may result in high rate of unnecessary breast pipes. The major professional organization don't recommend it as a part of routine screening. However, women should be counseled about breast self-awareness and this is very important really, breast self-awareness. And if the notice change and how their breast appear or feel masses, thickening, enlargement, they should be encouraged to have a medical evaluation. And this is very important, the breast self-awareness. What about MRI? MRI is used for screening for a special type of women, those with high risk of breast cancer such as those with BRCA gene mutation. For these women, screening should include MRI as well as mammography and clinical breast examination. MRI has higher sensitivity, but may be less specific. 
MRI may be recommended for women with dense breast tissue, as I mentioned before, as a part of overall assessment that include evaluation of the risk. What about breast ultrasound? Is it a screening method or not? Ultrasound is not typically used as a routine screening test for breast cancer, but it can be useful for looking at some breast changes like lumps, benign lesions. Also, ultrasound can differentiate between solid and cystic mass. Ultrasound is helpful in women with dense breast tissue, okay, which can make it hard to see abnormal areas on mammogram. It also can be used to get better luck at a suspicious area that was seen on a mammogram. Also, ultrasound is helpful in cases in whom ultrasound guided biopsy is needed. So I can use ultrasound to guide me during biopsy. Then you should write your report in standard method. That's why breast imaging reporting and data system is present and was developed by the American College of Radiology. Okay. It provides a widely accepted lexicon and reporting the schema for imaging of the breast. It applies to mammogram and the ultrasound and the MRI. So whatever the method used, the imaging modality, you can use the PIRATS, which is the abbreviation of breast imaging reporting and data system. Okay, so breast imaging studies are assigned one of the seven assessment categories, starting from pirates zero and going to one, two, three, four, five, and six. Zero means incomplete, so I need additional imaging evaluation. Maybe another view is mammogram or use of MRI or ultrasound or or whatever. So, I need additional imaging. I may need also 3D mammography. I use the traditional one. I'm in need for the 3D one, the digital one. Okay. So, the image, the first image is incomplete. This is by red zero. What about by red one? The result of imaging is negative. It's okay. It's fine. What about by reds 2? Indicating benign breast. If there is any lesion, it's flux benign. What about by reds 3? Probably benign. So there is less than 2% probability of malignancy. And this patient needs close or nearby monitoring. Okay? So you can advise her to come every three or six months to do follow-up. Okay? So this is as regard by red three, less than 2% of probability of malignancy. What about by red four, suspicious for malignancy from two to 94%. And this category also can be divided into three other subdivision three categories. Okay? What about, so this is suspicious for malignancy, so you should do a biopsy, for example. What about by RADS5? Highly suggestive malignancy. There is more than 95% probability of malignancy. What about by RADS6? This constitutes the non biopsy proven malignancy. Okay, already done. Okay, what about the breast cancer risk assessment tool? BCRAT. The breast cancer risk assessment tool or jail model can be used to calculate women's five year and the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. I want to know the lifetime risk of developing cancer or women's five year risk of developing breast cancer. So a woman is considered at average risk if her lifetime risk of breast cancer is less than 15%.
What about diagnosis of breast cancer? May be done with the screening during the screening program of breast cancer by mammography or breast examination and uh, imaging like ultrasonography or MRI. So may be done with this by screening or clinically by evaluation of the patient, the patient with breast symptoms, neb pain, nipple discharge, abnormal mass. This mass felt by the patient, the doctor examined the breast, he confirmed the presence of the mass, ultrasound was done on the breast, confirmed the presence of suspicious mass, then biopsy is taken from the mass to confirm diagnosis. If you found on examination signs suggesting breast cancer, highly suggesting breast cancer, take biopsy immediately without delay. However, pre biopsy bilateral mammogram may help delineate other areas that should be biopsied and provides baseline for future reference if you want to do comparison between the previous mammogram and the next one and so on. Okay, biopsy. What is the type of biopsy? Berkitina score needed biopsy. Okay? Okay. You can take it guided by palpation with the other hand or guided by ultrasound. Or biopsy may be stereotactic biopsy. What is the stereotactic? Done guided by mammography. Okay? The three-dimensional image in two planes. Okay? Or ultrasound guided biopsy. And the clips are placed at the biopsy site to identify it. If core biopsy is not possible, like what? Like if if the lesion is too posterior, I can't reach it with true cut. Okay? Surgical biopsy can be done. Guide wire is inserted under image and take the biopsy. Any skin taken with a biopsy specimen should be examined because it may show cancer cells in dermal lymphatic vessels. What is the indication? to test for gene mutation, DRCA1 and 2. The indication include patient at the age less than 45 with breast cancer and the cancer doesn't have estrogen or progesterone receptor or overexpression of HER2 protein, so we call it triple negative breast cancer. Breast and ovarian cancer occur in the same patient. Family history include multiple cases of early onset breast cancer or family history of multiple cases of ovarian or pancreatic cancer or patient have an Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. Breast and ovarian cancer occur in the same patient as I said. Patient have lobular breast cancer plus personal or family history of diffuse gastric cancer. So all these are indications to test for breast gene mutation BRCA1 and 2. What is the other investigation may be needed in case with breast cancer, chest x-ray, bone scanning, lab workup, like CBC, liver function test, measurement of serum calcium, also measurement of serum carcinoma embryonic antigen, cancer antigen 15-3, or cancer antigen 27-29 may be needed. What about grading and the staging? Grading include many grades, one, two, three, according to the differentiation. The advancement of the grade, the more, the less, sorry, the advancement of the grade, so grade three is the most less differentiated. Okay, so grade one is more differentiated than grade two, and so on. And there is the TNM classification system, tumor, node, and metastasis. This is the abbreviation of TNM metastasis. Okay. So, 
I should do the grading and the staging. I should have a biopsy from the mass in the breast, from the axillary lymph nodes. Okay. To know the what is the stage of our case. So this is as regards the TNM classification. T for primary tumor size, N for regional lymph node status, M for distant metastasis. Let us go in depth with the primary tumor. Sorry. TIS means the carcinoma in situ or budget with no tumor. T1, tumor less than 2 cm. T1C, T1 maybe 1A, 1B, and 1C, but overall T1 less than 2 cm less than two centimeter okay t2 from two to five centimeter t3 larger than five centimeter t4 also can be divided into a b c d t4a schist wall involvement t4b skin involvement t4c both t4 a and the 4b sorry sorry T4D inflammatory cancer. What about regional lymph node? N1 mobile epsilateral axillary lymph nodes present. N2 fixed or matted epsilateral axillary lymph nodes. N3 can be divided into three categories A, B, C. A for epsilateral infracravicular nodes. 3B for epsilateral internal memory nodes. 3C for epsilateral supraclavicular nodes. What about M, M1 for distant metastasis, M0 no metastasis. What is the stage? We have four stages. Stage one, two, three, four. Stage zero is as in carcinoma in situ, TIS. Stage one, T1, N0. Stage two, T2, N0, T3, N0. T0 N1, T1 N1, T2 N1, stage 3, skin or rib invasion, matted lymph nodes. Okay, and any locally advanced breast cancer. T3 N1, T0 N2, T1 N2, T2 N2, T3 N2. Stage 4, M1, and this is advanced breast cancer. The prognosis. Long term prognosis depend on tumor stage and the nodal status correlate with disease free and overall survival rate better than any other prognostic factor. So, what is very important is the tumor stage and the nodal status. Okay. The five year survival rate from the National Cancer Institute, surveillance, epidemiology, and the end result program and the abbreviation of S-E-E-R for this. Mention that localized confi confined to primary site. So the five year survival rate in case of localized tumor confined to the primary site, the five year survival rate reaching up to 99%. For regional, what is meant by regional? Confined to regional lymph nodes. The five year survival rate reach up to 86%. The distant metastasis, the five year survival rate dropped to 30%. Okay? Poor prognosis is associated with the following factors race, young age, high grade tumor, larger primary tumor, presence of HER2 protein, presence of BRCA gene mutation, patient with BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation appear to have worse prognosis. Okay? Young age prognosis appear worse. Patient diagnosed breast cancer in their 20 and 30. Race, breast cancer, death rate from 2012 to 2016 were higher in the United States in non-Hispanic black females than non-Hispanic white females. Larger primary tumor 
are more likely to have a worse prognosis. Okay, so all these are poor prognosis. What is the treatment? Treatment, surgery, radiation therapy, or systemic therapy. And the systemic therapy include chemotherapy, hormone therapy, or targeted therapy. Okay, what about surgery? I may do mastectomy or breast conserving surgery. As you look to the picture, if you remove the entire breast, this is called mastectomy. But breast conserving surgery, we are removing the tumor with safety margin at least one centimeter free from any tumor. So normal breast tissue. Okay, so this is a conservative breast surgery or breast conserving surgery, sorry. Okay, but not only alone, but with radiation. So breast conserving surgery plus radiation surgery is very important, okay? Okay, what about mastectomy? Mastectomy is the removal of entire breast and then I have different types of mastectomy. Skin sparing mastectomy spur the pectoral muscle and the enough skin to cover the wound, making breast reconstruction much easier and the spurred axillary lymph nodes. What about nibble sparing mastectomy? Same as skin sparing mastectomy plus spur the nibble and the areola. What about simple mastectomy? Spur the pectoral muscle and the axillary lymph node. What about modified radical mastectomy? Spur the pectoral muscle and remove some axillary lymph nodes. What about the radical mastectomy that was done in the past? Remove axillary lymph nodes and the pectoral muscle. And nowadays, it's really done. So, please look to this picture. In the past, we did radical mastectomy they remove the entire breast the pectoral is major and the minor uh, aggressive dissection of the axillary lymph nodes this is called radical mastectomy becomes modified with the sparing of the pectoralis muscle and the removing of the entire breast and the removing of some of the axillary lymph nodes so it's called the modified radical mastectomy now they are using more Conservative surgery, skin spurring mastectomy, nipple spurring mastectomy, simple mastectomy, breast conserving surgery with removal of the tumor and safety margin at least one centimeter of normal breast tissue and the separate incision for axillary lymph node and taking biopsy from centenary lymph node sentinel lymph node and if it is positive you are going to do axillary lymph node dissection if it is negative you are not to do any axillary lymph node dissection so the operation is easier take less time less complication and more breast conserve so this is for patient with invasive cancer survival and the recurrence rate with mastectomy don't differ significantly from those with breast conserving surgery plus radiation therapy as long as the entire tumor can be removed so it's very important point you should know so some physician prefer to give chemotherapy before and we call it new adjuvant surgery. new adjuvant chemotherapy we started first then do surgery why you started first to shrink the tumor before removing it and applying radiation therapy thus some patient who might otherwise have required mastectomy can have breast conserving surgery due to shrink of the tumor okay what about quadrantectomy quadrantectomy involves removing removing entire segment of the breast that contained the tumor okay what about the breast conserving surgery we talked about it and the quadrantectomy procedures are usually combined with axillary clearance through a separate incision as i mentioned axillary procedures may include sentinel lymph node biopsy sampling partial or complete axillary lymph node dissection okay lymph node evaluation Axillary lymph nodes are typically evaluated by either axillary lymph node dissection or sentinel lymph node biopsy. 
axillary lymph node this section we are going to dissect the axillary lymph node sentinel lymph node is the first lymph node to receive the malignant cell okay the sentinel means gore okay gore okay what about well, let us start with the axillary lymph node first Axillary lymph node dissection is a fairly extensive procedure that involves removal of many axillary nodes as possible. But the problem here is the side effect of this aggressive dissection of the axillary lymph nodes. The most important one is the lymphedema. Risk of lymphedema is increased for patients with a high preoperative body mass index, equal to or more than 30 and for those with significant weight gain during and after breast cancer treatment. Most clinician now, first do sentinel lymph node biopsy unless biopsy of clinically suspect nodes detected cancer. Risk of lymphedema is less with sentinel lymph node biopsy and this is advantage to use sentinel lymph node biopsy. It carry less risk of occurrence of lymphedema, okay? Okay, routine use of axillary lymph node dissection is not justified because the main value of lymph nodes removal is diagnostic, not therapeutic. And sentinel lymph node biopsy has equal to or more than 95% sensitivity for axillary node involvement. So why am I not going to do sentinel lymph node biopsy? Sentinel lymph node biopsy is better so long as the lymph nodes, it doesn't look suspicious or there is clinical evidence that this is malignant, okay? So, sentinel lymph node is very important. So, what is sentinel lymph node? As I said before, sentinel means guard. Sentinel lymph node is the first one to receive the malignant cell. So, the first to drain to the breast. How I could know which lymph node is the first one? The malignant cell will lay in by injecting dye around the breast or around the tumor like that, blue dye. And the lymph node, the first to have the color blue will be the sentinel lymph node. So I'll take a biopsy from this, dissect this sentinel lymph node and send for histopathology. If it is positive for malignant cell, I can continue to do axillary lymph node dissection. If it is negative, I am not in need to do any aggressive axillary lymph node dissection. So what is very important here? The importance here is that I did the very minor surgery here, dissecting only the sentinel lymph node and send for us to basalic. If it is negative, I'm not going to do axillary lymph node dissection. I protect the, the patient from side effect of lymphedema, which occur after aggressive axillary lymph node dissection. Okay? So how I know which lymph node is the sentinel one, the first to receive the drain or the malignant cell by injecting the dye, the blue dye around the tumor or around here, as you see, the blue color will go to first lymph node is the sentinel lymph node. Okay? Okay. Or another method, I inject trace radioactive colloid then using gamma probe I can locate the which one is sentinel lymph node so radioactive colloid is injected in the breast and this probe will detect which one is the sentinel lymph node okay this is another way to know the sentinel lymph node. Okay? And the first to receive the tracer is considered the sentinel lymph node. Okay? This is how to know the sentinel lymph node. By injecting dye or radioactive colloid, blue dye will appear in the sentinel lymph node or radioactive colloid will be detected with gamma probe either one of them 
the most easy for you or accessible for you, you can use it. Okay. Let us speak about the reconstructive procedure. Breast reconstruction can be done during the initial mastectomy or breast conserving surgery or later as a separate procedure. So it can be done during the same surgery or later on. It is important, by the way, don't take it easy because it's important for the mental health of the woman who has breast cancer. So take it serious. Timing of surgery depend on the patient preference as well as the need for adjuvant therapy, such as radiation therapy. The best candidate for oncoplastic surgery are patients with static breast or sagging breast. Those are the best candidates. Reconstructive procedure may be prosthetic reconstruction by placement of silicone or saline implant or autologous reconstruction using muscle flap transfer like latissimus dorsi or gluteus maximus or lower rectus abdominis or muscle-free flap transfer. What about contralateral breast? The other breast. We have a case with one breast with breast cancer and the other breast is normal. What we are going to do with the normal one, the contralateral one? Contralateral prophylactic mastectomy is needed. It is an option. It is an option for some women with breast cancer, especially those who are at high risk of developing breast cancer due to genetic mutation, those with positive BRCA1 or 2G mutation. It is not mandatory for all patients. Close surveillance is a reasonable alternative. So the alternative to do contralateral prophylactic mastectomy is close surveillance for this woman. What about radiation therapy? Radiation therapy after breast conserving surgery significantly reduce incidence of local recurrence in breast and regional lymph nodes and may improve overall survival. Radiation therapy is not necessary for women 70 years of age and older with a small lymph node negative, also hormone receptor positive cancer because it has not been shown to improve survival. So, in post-menopause, over the age of 70, with small lymph nodes, negative for tumor, also, as regards hormonal tumor marker, positive, she is not in need for radiotherapy. Who in need for radiotherapy? The younger woman who did breast conserving surgery, to reduce the incidence of local recurrence in the breast and the original lymph node. Radiation therapy is indicated after mastectomy F. What is the indication of radiation therapy after mastectomy? If the primary tumor is equal to or more than 5 cm, if axillary nodes are involved, if margins are positive for cancer in resected tissue, we should do radiotherapy. It can also be used as a palliative therapy in advanced cases such as central nervous system or bone metastasis. What is the delivery method? Delivery through brachytherapy or, or, or external beam radiation, which is more common, external beam radiation. So both of them is present, but what is common is external beam radiation than brachytherapy. Or combination of both. What is the side effects of radiation therapy? Early like fatigue and skin changes, like skin peeling, redness, darkening. Late like lymphedema, brachial vexopathy, radiation, pneumonitis, root damage, secondary cancer and the cardiac toxicity. Let us go to the systemic therapy, including chemotherapy, hormone therapy, targeted therapy. Chemotherapy is usually begun soon after surgery if systemic chemotherapy is not required. Endocrine therapy is usually begun soon after surgery and is continued for 5 to 10 years. Combination chemotherapy regimen are more effective than single drug. 
those dense regimen given for four to six months is preferred if tumor are more than five centimeters systemic steroid may be started before surgery to reduce the size of the tumor indication for chemotherapy are one of or more of the following estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor negative a human epidermal growth factor 2 oncogene positive estrogen and progesterone positive and the positive lymph node in a premenopausal patient estrogen and the progesterone positive and the her2 with high oncotype dx score what is the type of chemotherapy we have a first generation chemotherapy like cyclophosphamide mesotrexate 5 fluoros here in a six month cycle also we have a modern chemotherapy regimen includes anthracyclines like doxorubicin or ibuprofen and the newer agents such as taxanes and the three to six months period is used for adjuvant and the new adjuvant chemotherapy What about the hormone therapy? Hormone therapy including tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitor. Tamoxifen, this drug competitively binds with estrogen receptor. The main stay of treatment for most premenopausal women, premenopausal women with hormone receptor positive tumor is tamoxifen. Some women may also benefit from surgical removal like ophrectomy, for example, or chemical suppression of the ovary okay which are the main source of estrogen before menopause adjuvant treatment of early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer with tamoxifen for at least five years has been shown to reduce the recurrence rate by about half throughout the first 10 years and they reduce breast cancer mortality by about 30 percent throughout the first 15 years the clinical practice guidelines nowadays recommend consideration of adjuvant tamoxifen therapy for 10 years. But what is the problem with the tamoxifen? Tamoxifen significantly increases the risk of development of endometrial cancer. Reported incidence is 1% of postmenopausal women after 5 years of use. Thus, if such women have spotting or bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, I mean, they must be evaluated for endometrial cancer by transvaginal ultrasound and the endometrial biopsy and so on. What about aromatase inhibitor? Aromatase inhibitor like anastrozole, like letrozole, block peripheral production of estrogen in postmenopausal women. Okay? More effective than tamoxifen, these drugs are becoming the preferred treatment for early stage hormone receptor positive cancer in postmenopausal patients and the treatment guidelines recommend aromatase inhibitors such as anastrozole should usually be included in the treatment of postmenopausal women with human with hormone receptor positive breast cancer what about targeted therapy targeted therapy is usually indicated in about 17 percent of breast cancer that overproduce the gross promoting protein HER2. Like what? Targeted therapy like trastuzumab. And this is the first approved drug, by the way. It is a humanized monoclonal antibody that directly targets the HER2 protein. It will reduce the risk of recurrence and the death by 52% and the 33% respectively if combined with chemotherapy in HER2 positive early breast cancer if compared to chemotherapy alone. Trastuzumab is usually continued for one year but still there is research about this point and about the duration of treatment of trastuzumab. So if you ask me trastuzumab plus chemotherapy is better or chemotherapy alone i'll say of course trastuzumab plus chemotherapy is better why because it reduces the risks of recurrence and the death 
by 52% and 33% respectively. And this is the end of my lecture today. This is my box published on Amazon, textbook of obstetric, textbook of gynecology, contraception handbook, multiple choice question book, and the newer one, medical disorder in pregnancy book. You can find them on my site on Amazon. Just search for my name, Ala Musbah. You can find me. And this is my YouTube channel link. And this is my blogspot link. Thank you, everybody. And my best wishes for all of you.